August 1st, 2018 is Earth Overshoot Day. What does that mean? How many people know about this? And what do we need to be doing? Find out on this episode of the Growth Busters podcast. Calling, 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 calling. Call the Growth Buster. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, welcome to the Growth Busters podcast. Thanks for joining us on your journey to sustainability. I'm Dave Gardner, director of the documentary Growth Busters Hooked on Growth, and I'm joined, as usual, by Dana Hickey. Hi, Dana. Hey. She's a woman of many words. Yeah. <laughs> Three letters so far. Hey. <laughs> this podcast is always about overshoot and what we can do about it. So we obviously can't let Earth Overshoot Day come and go without devoting an episode to it. But first, some good news. Straws. Yeah, there's been a lot of updates of straws. This has been exciting because we've posted on social media about how Starbucks has decided they're going to eliminate their straws. And that's a huge deal. And Seattle has decided that they're going to eliminate their straws in restaurants. And that's going to take a lot of plastic out of the environment and ocean. So I'm very excited about that. Yeah, in fact, wasn't it an ordinance that got passed in Seattle that'll ban not just disposable plastic straws, but disposable single-use plastic Like utensils silverware. and yeah. stuff, yeah. So it's a big step because it's one of the largest cities that's done that. And also recently, apparently, American Airlines is the largest airlines that has banned plastic straws that they're starting to put that in. So that's exciting because airlines produce so much waste that just even a little thing like that is helpful. I have to throw my caveat in here because we've <laughs> we've ended up talking about plastic <laughs> straws on three episodes now, right? I think the first one was, uh, I think, episode 13 when we first brought it up. And I probably do the caveat every time. And that is, it's great that we're making this progress really important, especially for the health of our oceans and sea life. But in the grand scheme of living sustainably, it's not going to put us there, right? Yeah, no. Yeah, it's a tiny thing. But it is, it's hopeful to like see that companies and organizations are working towards that in cities when sometimes it's not overarching thing. But we know that from the bottom up, it's starting to work. Yeah. And just having those things on our mind as we keep on adding more and more things to what becomes the norm. The new norm will be no disposable plastic straws. Eventually, the new norm will be no disposable plastic silverware. And then somewhere up that curve, the new norm will be choosing small families, getting on your bike instead of your car, not chasing economic growth forever, Mm -hmm. and eventually living sustainably. Yeah. 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 Hopefully. Well, there was a tweet on the straw topic that I wanted to share also. This was a tweet by Maddie and I'm assuming Maddie is a she. Here's what she wrote. How did straws and people who use them become the targets for reducing waste rather than like the companies who bang on planned obsolescence for the machines they produce by the millions that contain all types of plastics and toxic metals? Had to take a couple of breaths <laughs> in the middle of that run-on sentence. But So what do you think about that? Well, I actually just read, I was looking for quotes for our Instagram, and I read this really interesting one that... I can't remember who it's by, I'm sorry. But they were talking about how it's strange that people and you know consumers have to be the ones that look out for things that are sustainable or things with less plastic or things that are good for the environment or even good for human health. And they were commenting on that it's something that you know the industry should be doing, but yet the consumer is the one that has to. So I think it, she makes a good point. That's like, well, an inter- interesting point, I guess, that she's like, it's why are we the ones that have to do it? Why aren't companies? So Yeah, and I can't believe how many times I've had that conversation just in the last week. It <laughs> seems to come up time and again. A number of people have kind of pushed back a little bit on some of our focus on individual behavior. And good grief, it would be great if we could get the system to change, if we could get national policy change to stop pursuing economic growth, for example. And it would be great if we could get, uh, you know, certainly if you're comparing the impact of your behavioral changes to the impact of Procter & Gamble, you know, doing something completely different and, you know, eliminating products that are really bad news for uh, maintaining our, our ecosystems. Yeah, it would be wonderful for Procter & Gamble to make that change or for the U.S. Congress to make that change or the Federal Reserve to make that kind of change. But I just don't think we can just sit on our hands and wait for the system to change. Yeah, because it's like you can hope that that will happen, but 
like if you don't do anything they're not going to see an example of why it should they're going to just think that everyone's content with how it is so in my opinion you have to show some initiative to be like we want this to happen as you know citizens or people of the world i guess yeah, yeah eventually i think that the elected officials are going to look around and see all of these people who used to be consumers who are now citizens again and are behaving sustainably and they're going to say oh gosh <laughs> I need to rethink my approach to lawmaking here. And in fact, come to think of it, Dana, eventually we're going to be electing someone who grew up in a household where <laughs> the norm was much more sustainable behavior. And so it'll just be natural for them to be in favor of policies that make a whole lot more sense. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know if we can wait that long, but we'll see. We'll find out. Okay. Before we get into the topic of the day, listener feedback, we always want to include some of that. And we had something interesting. Do you have that email? We have a snippet of it. And I had brought up previously the topic of almond milk because almond milk, there's some issues with it in my opinion. But they made a really good comment that they said, I respect and appreciate all of your efforts very much. I want to respectfully challenge the notion that almonds are worse for the environment than dairy. And I just wanted to say that when you produce almond milk, it is less water consumption than dairy. And so they are right. So great job in being informed and knowing about that. But I wanted to give some facts about just dairy alternatives and producing milk in general, because I don't want to tell someone like you can't have this milk or you should have this milk. I just generally want to say these are the facts of the different milk alternatives for the environment, I guess. And there's so many variables. It's yeah, there's, not black and white. Yeah, and it's crazy now because when I was younger, there was just you know almond milk and dairy milk. That was about it. And now there's probably eight or ten different kinds, and each one has a different variable that impacts, like what type of plant it comes from or like what the transportation, the water. So there's a lot of factors that go in it. So whenever you are choosing what milk substitute or if you choose dairy milk you just got to think about some other factors other than like just water or something so. yeah and i keep interrupting you but one example would be if there was a dairy right next door but if you used coconut milk it was being flown halfway around the world that would change the math wouldn't it yeah because a lot of times you know we just look at you know water because that's a huge thing that we you know it's more tangible i feel like for a lot of people yeah. but if you think about that a lot of the ingredients that go into these milks like they come from a long way and a lot of co2 emissions from transporting those goods so you have to weigh those costs and benefits too so i was looking up some facts about all these milk alternatives and i'm just going to start with almond milk because it it starts with a (laughs) (laughs) um so almonds in the u.s about 90 to 99 percent it was varied depending on where you looked at it all these almonds that we get in America are grown in California. So that's a red flag for me at first, just because, you know, there's a big drought going on and they have to ship in a lot of their water, which is another cost. And then they're also running out of water and water is one of those things. It's like, once you're out of it, you're kind of out of it. So even though almond milk consumes less water than dairy, you have to factor in how they're getting their water. So a lot of the dairy farms are in areas that have a lot of water naturally. So that's an interesting balance that you have to think about, that there's an extra tack on cost of where the water's coming from. And then dairy milk. Also, there are some other negatives like methane release from the cows and then like the other CO2 and then also producing the food for the cows. So like those are some negative factors too. So dairy is also not that great, I guess, either. But it's also an interesting factor. And sorry, I'm like rambling on about milk. I mean, who would have I thought? Think it, I think it's pretty interesting stuff. <laughs> um, But also with almond milk, for me as a vegetarian, it doesn't have a lot of protein in it. It has one to two grams, depending on if you make it yourself, it has more. But if I want, you know, a a substantial amount of protein in my diet, I usually try to go for dairy or pea protein milk, which I'll get to later, which I love. But both of those have probably about eight or 10 grams of protein per glass. So that's four to eight times more protein per glass. So if you look at the comparison of, I'm going to have to have eight glasses of almond milk, that's a lot more water to produce those eight glasses than the one glass of dairy milk. So it might not be even, it might not be the same, but it's just an interesting comparison that you don't look at. So if you're you know, looking for the protein standpoint, it yeah. might be a different one to choose. Yeah, and you got to compare that with, well, what are the, your other ways of getting protein? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like if you just want to put it in cereal, you know, it might be fine. But, you know, there's just different factors that I feel like this debate doesn't always take into account sometimes. 
So talking about pea protein milk, I just tried it recently in recommendation of one of my friends. She's also a vegetarian and she's almost vegan, so she's doing better than I am. (laughs) But she recommended this because she had done some research and it's one of the most environmentally friendly milk alternatives that I've found. There are some drawbacks because a lot of the peas that are grown, some of them come from France, which can be an issue depending on, like that's a transportation cost, you know, CO2. But they also are grown in areas that have a lot of water already. So they don't have to have the irrigation and all of that. And Uh they're a lot more sustainable because I'm pretty sure, I think they're legumes. Okay. Peas are nitrogen fixing plants. So that's an even better aspect. So let me explain that. So plants like peas and beans and stuff in that family, they have these little nodules on their roots and they, you don't need fertilizer really because they pull the nitrogen from the soil. So it's a lot more sustainable for the environment because they can kind of enrich the soil themselves, which is another factor because a lot of times when these like crops are produced, you have to put a lot of fertilizer in them or like just other pollutants to the environment. So like just another box to check off that it's like it helps the the soil to some extent too yeah so that was devastating our soil so yeah. that was when i read about that i got very excited because i was like oh legumes so i thought that was cool there's also you know rice milk coconut milk hemp milk cashew milk and soy milk there's a ton of different ones soy milk's also a really good alternative because it has eight grams of protein and it's a little more sustainable there are some issues with like deforestation in some areas of that produce soy. Uh-huh. So that was an interesting factor because soy is in like everything vegetarian. So that's a, another issue, but it is in certain areas that have water that is more abundant. So if you're concerned about that, you can balance those issues, I guess. <laughs> but there was a lot of interesting facts and I can post some of the links that I found if you want to look at more. But Yeah, that's great. So check the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry for the... If you want to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, but thank you for the listener to comment in so that we could talk about this more and just explore the different milk varieties and options and impacts and such. Do so. we have the first name of the listener? Troy, yes. Thank Troy you, Troy. Comment. All right. Yes. <laughs> right about now, you might just be thinking, boy, what a bummer. I need a team of analysts to help me figure out what to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner in order to live sustainably. I mean, right? Yeah. (laughs) Well, it was funny because I was joking with one of my friends that we were like, eating food is like one of the worst things you can do for the environment. Like, (laughs) it sounds so bad, but like how you produce the food, moving the food, and then like everything that goes into it, you're like, that's a big factor. So like, we should just stop eating. Like, <laughs> Wow. And then <laughs> about 40 days after you stop eating, then you're, you're yeah, not going to be creating yeah. any carbon emissions at all. <laughs> yeah, obviously not the best one, but we just, we were joking around. We were like, oh, this is <laughs> one solution that's terrible, but it was just an interesting point. <laughs> For me, it just points out the complexity. The bigger our scale on the planet, the more complex it gets. It becomes so much more important when, when you have 7.6 billion people on the planet than when you have a billion people on the planet. The decisions you make about whether you're drinking almond milk or, or dairy milk, you know what kind of car you're buying, if you're buying a car, uh, all of that stuff. I mean, the impacts are so much greater when they're multiplied by a few extra billion people and our lives would be so much simpler if we had 200 years ago stopped growing the human population at a billion perhaps we'd still need to be behaving ethically but it wouldn't be you know the the price tag wouldn't be so extreme yeah we have i think also so much ability to you know you know transport things from halfway across the world that that in, like we can do it so we're like oh we should and so that's another factor. It's like everything we eat, it's like, does this even, is it local? Is it not? Like you don't think about it because it's in the grocery store. So you're like, ah, oh, it's fine. Yeah, good so. point. Yeah. So it just keeps getting more complicated. All right. Well, now, August 1st is Earth Overshoot Day. And Dana, you and I have been working a little bit on a project for that. We've been creating a video. Yeah. Which yeah, I'm very pretty exciting. excited about. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's a pretty neat video, in fact. Mm-hmm. Our plan is about the same time we publish this episode of the Growth Busters podcast, we're going to post our Earth Overshoot Day video. So we'll kind of cross-link back and forth between the two of them. And 
I think it's just such an important day that it bears uh, some conversation just about the day itself, but also I think we could have some fun talking a little bit about what we discovered in the course of producing this video as well. Yeah. 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 We learned a lot of stuff from what people knew about Earth Overshoot Day or just like in the environment in general, which I thought was really exciting when we filmed this. So. Of course, I think the biggest takeaway, which I don't guess it surprised me much, was that of all the people, we basically went out on the streets and interviewed men, women, teenagers to retirees. And the first question we asked every one of them was, August 1st is Earth Overshoot Day. Do you know what that is? And did a single person that we spoke with know what that was? Nope. Not one. Yeah. <laughs> So, great start. <laughs> so, does that tell us that we need to move to Portland? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Portland's a nice place, I've heard. Or Boulder. Or, uh, <laughs> so, we may not be living in the most uh, enlightened and progressive part of the U.S., but I think we'd get the same results pretty much wherever we went, and probably just about anywhere in the world. And that's so disappointing because it should be like the biggest news item on August 1st should be Earth Overshoot Day. Yeah. It's a... It was interesting because when we told people about it, they were shocked or amazed. And they're like, oh, this is important. Like, we should know about it. So it was great that they wanted to know about it. But we just don't have the media sources, I guess, that are saying this is important. And like the mainstream ones, I guess. Yeah. They knew it was important. But I don't think many of them knew we are in overshoot or knew what overshoot is. Yeah. So maybe we ought to back up and just kind of briefly fill our listeners in about what Earth Overshoot Day is and what Overshoot is. you want to take a stab at either of those? Basically, Earth Overshoot Day is the day that and it's taken seven months for everyone to use all the things that the Earth can replenish in a year's time. And it gets earlier and early every year because we use our resources more. And I think in the 60s, it was actually in December. And we want it on December 31st, the last day possible, so that the Earth has time to replenish, basically. Of course, it's an estimate. Yeah. <laughs> and it's based on data that is collected and analyzed by the Global Footprint Network. And I really want to just give a shout out to the Global Footprint Network and for the work they're doing. And they're doing their best to not just give us the data, but then to also try to make sure that we know what it means. And that's why they came up with Earth Overshoot Day. Originally, they were just determining whether we were living in overshoot or not. You know, are we living sustainably? Now they're, they've come up with a really great way to communicate it and kind of popularize the message. So not only are they just determining whether we are living within the ecological limits of the planet, but now they've found a good way to kind of communicate to us and illustrate to us when we're not. And yeah, so since the late 1960s, we have been in overshoot. And an overshoot is that uh, the scale of the human enterprise has outgrown the planet. The, the combination of how many of us there are and the way we're behaving, the size of the global economy, you could say, is really putting too much pressure on the planet. The planet in a year's time cannot recover from our activity in seven months now. Yeah. Right now, in seven months, we basically spin through a year's worth of the Earth's regenerative capacity. So you would think, if you were just kind of taking a simplistic view of this, that would mean that after August 1st, we're done. Our goose is cooked. Yeah, but we're actually like taking resources from future possibility of like producing resources. We're kind of depleting the environment and, you know, pulling from things that we might not be able to restore later. We're liquidating the principle, kind of like withdrawing the principle from your savings yeah. account. We're damaging the ecosystem's capacity in the future because we have exceeded the regenerative capacity. We keep on pulling out of those ecosystems, and that means we get by for a while, but it means next year the biocapacity of the planet is probably less than this year because yeah. we've damaged those ecosystems. And I think that's what a lot of people don't realize with Earth Urbushu Day is that they might think, oh, well, I guess we're fine because we still are producing things, but you don't know where that production cost is coming from. Like, they can't tell as much of the impact right now unless you really look for it, I guess. Yeah, it's pretty invisible and it's pretty slow motion. But a couple of the obvious ones are, well, we're pumping aquifers dry, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we, you know, we lower the water level in major aquifer 
maybe a foot, maybe 10 feet, maybe 20 feet a year, but we still get water. The wells still produce. But each year, a few wells stop producing. And over the course of 20 years, you get to the point where you can't find water. And some of the things that we might want to share about this are actually in the video. And so we definitely want to encourage you to view the video and share it. But why don't we just stop and listen to the soundtrack of the video right now? And then we can come back after, I think it's about six minutes long. And so in six minutes, we can come back and kind of comment a little bit further on that. You want to do that? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so here's the soundtrack to the new Growth Busters Earth Overshoot Day 2018 video. August 1st is Earth Overshoot Day. Were you aware of that? I was not aware of that. Had you heard of that? No, never have. What is that? What about the concept of overshoot? I've not heard of it. Maybe it's got to do with the climate. Well, that's a big part of it, but not all of it. Overshoot is actually the fact that uh, the human, human race has outgrown the planet. Scientists at the Global Footprint Network have been busy calculating how we're doing in terms of living sustainably. On August 1st, we will have already, around the world, used all of the resources that we depend on that the planet can replenish in a year's time. The fact that Earth Overshoot Day this year is August 1st, that means that we are... Bad. St- that's bad. That's that's horrible. So if we were living sustainably uh, so that future generations would have as much access to resources as we do, then Earth Overshoot Day would be when? December 31st. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, like the, like midnight midnight on the last day. last second, <laughs> right? But it's been slowly moving earlier and earlier in the year over the last several decades, telling us that we're actually using resources faster than the Earth can regenerate them. Definitely we're living too hard on the planet. How does that make you feel to know that we're looking at August 1st this year? Uh, I mean, it's kind of scary when you think about it. We celebrate if we're building more houses. We celebrate if we're buying more cars. Uh, It seems like we have a system that depends on us consuming more year after year. We do have a system that depends on that, and not rightfully so. If they just looked at the U.S., if uh, the way we live, it would require five planet Earths if everyone around the world were to adopt our lifestyle. Does that surprise you? No, it does not. It does not surprise. I think I've heard and seen, right? We were one of the most wasteful nations in the world. So do you have any ideas about things that we could be doing to move the date of Earth Overshoot Day later back to toward December 31st? Hmm. Um, just being conscious of what we're producing, our waste. And what we're putting into the environment with chemicals, dyes, emissions, um, how we dispose of waste, how we eat. Are you suggesting maybe we should be eating less meat or no meat? Fully sourced foods. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how about a lot less meat? Would that make a difference? Yes. Eat fewer vegetables? Eat more vegetables. Less <laughs> less garbage. <laughs> our water co- conservation, it's important to take care of our waterways. I have a hard time with my daughter who loves to take long showers. People irrigate, you know, two acre lot and uh, we just don't have that much water. Be a little bit more conscientious about, you know, throwing things away instead of using them again. Make things efficient, look for cleaner sources of energy, using our resources widely. I think we have some legit technology out there that can actually make, like even solar, is like can be a legit power now. They tell us that, uh, that if we could have our carbon emissions, that that would actually push Earth Overshoot Day three whole months later. The people that can make a difference that control are in control aren't paying attention. You would hope that politicians and elected officials would take note of that and really start changing policy that would benefit the earth and further educate people just on what's going on with the environment. We have to bring people into power who do understand that. Really it just starts with with yourself. I try to live in a manner where I have, a, where I have a, a small footprint. What are your ideas? Well? I think we just still have too much disposable styrofoams, bags. I leave my car in the garage more and more often and ride a bicycle. I got rid of the car. Urban areas can uh, you know, go to more of that approach where we get rid of all of the cars like that and have less emissions, that'd be great. 
Does that include walking and mass oh, transportation? I, I wear moccasins. And I do like that our public um, transportation is very nice here. Ubers are great now. Um, ride shares. I um, have three bicycles that I put these little 80 in, eighty size engines in them. And not only does it pedal, if you get tired, you can pull you and it gets about 100 miles to the gallon. We've given up paper towels and paper napkins at That's my house. Good. Yeah, we have des- dedicated rags and we recycle t-shirts. <laughs> so does this mean that you're trying to use your pl- private jet a little less often? Yeah, if I, if I ever get one, I'll use it less often. Cut back on airplanes, how many airplanes we use, like a day type stuff like that, you know what I mean? Now I know of one guy who gave up toilet paper. A bidet is not bad. <laughs> I like bidets. <laughs> I feel like it's the population thing that's really messing around with that. Is that what it is, the population? I know people with five, six kids. Now, when we should, nobody, I don't think anyone should be having more than a couple. How many of us there are and how big we're living, really, right? At McMansions, nobody needs that. Only flush the toilet once a month? Uh, uh, tiny house, I need more than that. <laughs> yeah, it just, you know, every little thing. Just being conscious of what you're doing. But it is a little bit of a sacrifice, right? Yes, it is. But would you make that if that uh, if your children and grandchildren would have a better world? Most definitely. Yes, I would. I have a daughter. I'd like her to live on a good earth, <laughs> hopefully, you know. Do you think that if more people knew about Earth Overshoot Day, that just as a general rule, humanity would shrink its footprint a little bit? I believe it would. Earth's a great place. We ought to save it. So let's both race home and tell our kids, first of all, (laughs) I'm sorry. And then second of all, tell them about Earth Overshoot Day. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Are you depressed or are you inspired? (laughs) I mean, I thought it was pretty inspiring. (laughs) Well, we tried to make it inspiring. We didn't just really want to make a video that said, boy, we are done. Write your will and uh, begin planning for the collapse of human civilization. Yeah. So instead, we tried to focus on some of the things that we could do to move the date later. And that's really the big campaign that the Global Footprint Network has been pushing this year is move the date. What can we do to make uh, Earth Overshoot Day later next year? Every year it's been marching earlier and earlier. And so how about moving it later and later? Because otherwise our goose really is cooked. Yeah. I think it's interesting, though, that some of the data that they've shared with us this time around is that humanity's total ecological footprint sort of plateaued from 2013 to 2014. Uh, 2014 is the last year of hard data that they've been able to analyze. So what they've done to give us Earth Overshoot Day in 2018 is that they've done some forecasting to estimate what changes would take place in the data during the four years that we're still busy collecting data for. If we're looking at hard data, we're looking at 2013-2014 trend, and the trend was the footprint remained pretty much constant from 2013 to 2014. So you might be tempted to say, oh, well, we can relax. Mm, (laughs) I don't think so. We don't have it tackled? Uh, No. I feel like it's just like a Band-Aid on it. You're just like, oh, it's fine. But it, I think we're still producing so much and our consumption levels are extremely high. And as more countries become developed, that's another issue that's going to cause more strain on the environment. Because if everyone lived at our standards, it's not very sustainable at all. Yeah. And they say that right now, uh, worldwide, it would take 1.7 planet Earths to sustainably meet the needs and wants and desires of the 7.6 billion people walking the planet today, the way we're all living on average right now. And so plateauing <laughs> at that 1.7 <laughs> Earth level, that's not we something We don't to have 1.7 Earths. We don't, yeah. So we don't want to plateau there. Because if we did, that would be just like plateauing at pulling principal out of your savings account every year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know you're going to get that account down to zero if you do that. Now, one thing did decrease from 2013 to 2014, and that was the global ecological footprint per person. They estimate that it went down about 1.1%. But what went up about 1%? Probably the population. Population. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's why it just sort of plateaued. Yeah. And what are they expecting populations going to do over the next 80 years? Increase. <laughs> yeah, so... The math gets a little bit complicated, but I guess there's some hope that we can see signs that individuals are able to reduce their ecological footprint. Mm -hmm. And part of that even includes your procreative 
activity, you know. So if we continue to reduce fertility rates and we continue to skinny up our lives a little bit and be a little bit smarter about uh, what we consume, then maybe there is hope. Yeah. So I mentioned that we need 1.7 planet Earths right now. Here's some other things I found fascinating. The average ecological footprint worldwide per person is 2.8 global hectares. That's how much of the planet each person is using as a carbon sink, using to generate their food and their water and giving them a place to live as well. Now, a global hectare, for those people who don't think in global hectares, and that would include me, I don't know about you. (laughs) I don't. Uh, What did we determine it was? It's about... 2.4. 2.4. Okay. 2.4 acres. acres Almost is, 2.5. Is, okay. It's <laughs> a, a global hectare. In case you want to know that. But anyway, we can just keep talking in global hectare. So 2.8 is the average per person ecological footprint. But what they do is they estimate the biocapacity of the planet. And their estimate is that the available biocapacity is 1.7 global hectares per person. So Worldwide, on average, that's how we end up needing 1.7 planet Earths right now. Now, you can guess if the average ecological footprint is 2.8 global hectares, you can probably guess that the average ecological footprint in North America or Western Europe or Australia is probably a little bigger than that. Yeah, I don't think we would consider ourselves average living compared to the rest of the world. So No, we're way above average, aren't we? <laughs> So let's just look at the U.S. I have this handy chart here, Dana. So here in the U.S., ecological footprint per person, 8.4 global hectares. Now remember, there's 1.7 global hectares per person in available biocapacity. So we're what? We're using over four times what's really available to us, over four times our share. What if we compared what we're doing with the biocapacity of the United States? Let's say that, and I think as we pack the planet, we have to think this way more and more, don't you? That we need to really look at self-sufficiency. We can't continue to import food from other parts of the globe because there are populations growing in other parts of the globe who really deserve access to that food and to other things that sustain life. And so while right now we're busy appropriating resources from all over the planet, on a full planet, we really should just be using the resources that are close to home. Yeah. Okay. And so the resources close to home, we're fortunate in the U.S. that the average biocapacity per person in the U.S. is 3.6 global hectares instead of that 1.7. So if we just said, in order to live ethically, we want to live within the biocapacity of the United States, then we're, what, we're only about just a little over two times as big in the way we live (laughs) instead of four. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's still a lot more. (laughs) Yeah. Either way, we got some work to do. And I thought it was interesting. We did a lot of editing. There's a lot of parts of these man and woman on the street interviews we did for the video that aren't in the video because we needed to keep the video pretty short because everybody's got attention deficit (laughs) disorder out there apparently. So one of the things that you won't be able to tell from watching the video or listening to the soundtrack that we just played is how many people gravitated pretty quickly to recycling as a way to move the date later. Yeah, I thought that was interesting because especially with the new things that how China's not taking a lot of our recycling anymore, which is a big issue because there's also like so much politics involved with like recycling. Who would have thought? <laughs> but just because something goes in the recycling bin does not mean it's going to be recycled or used because a lot of the materials are just like sitting somewhere waiting to be used because industries aren't utilizing that resource. So just recycling does not help that much. Yeah. I found it so fascinating that that was the first thing that comes to mind. And for most people, never comes to mind using cloth napkins instead of paper napkins. Uh, Really, there weren't that many people who said, oh, don't drive, use mass transportation or walk or ride a bicycle. Not that many people came up with that. Few, if any, said, oh, uh, stop running my air conditioner in the summer. Those are things that have a a bigger impact. And very few people said anything about having fewer children. Yeah. Which, of course, is the single biggest sustainability decision anybody walking the planet can make. The Lund University study that came out last summer did a really good job of quantifying that. 
And that's just not something people think about. They think about recycling. Mm -hmm. At least they're thinking about recycling instead of just throwing stuff away. But it's such a small part of it. Like There was one presentation I didn't last semester at school that was about recycling and stuff for on-campus things. Uh And it was interesting because one of the – I started with, it's like, you have the phrase reduce, reuse, recycle for a reason. Like, it's in that order for a reason. People are like, oh, my gosh, what? I didn't know there's a reason behind that. And I was just like – yeah, because <laughs> you're supposed to reduce your impact and then reuse items if you can't like reduce it, and then you recycle. You don't start with recycling. You try other things first. So. Yeah, a great example would be, I know there are a lot of people who pretty much consume bottled water. They buy cases of bottled water at the store, and they drink their water out of a bottle, and the environmental impact is huge. And then they feel okay about it because they recycled the plastic bottle. Yeah. So much of that plastic isn't being used. It's just sitting somewhere, or like it's being, like the streams are getting like crossed, and then then you can't recycle it, and there's just so many issues. <laughs> and when it works perfectly, it still takes a lot of energy to mm-hmm. do the recycling. And so I think that points out the importance of Earth Overshoot Day is that we really do have this educational challenge ahead of us that we need to really make sure that people around the world understand that we are in overshoot today, that we went into overshoot, according to the Global Footprint Network, back in the 70s. And uh, they're not the only ones. Uh, That math has been corroborated by a number of other studies, the famous MIT Limits to Growth study came to the same conclusion. People don't know that. So number one, we really need to make sure people know that. And then number two, we really need to make it the norm to just behave differently, to really conserve our energy use and conserve our, you know, stop shopping. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Don't replace your smartphone once a year. There's so many things. And and we didn't find that much imagination out there when we were doing these interviews. So I think we've got our work cut out for us. And maybe next year we'll do another one, or maybe we need to wait five years in order to see enough of a difference. But if you're listening to this podcast, one of the things you can do to help is share this podcast with your friends. Try to get more people to listen to it. Share that video so that we can wake a few people up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what? There was one really bright young man that I think we both really enjoyed going through his interview more than any of the other interviews. His name is Juju. He's going to be a junior in high school. And he was really interested in science. In fact, when I told him what we were doing and he was thinking about whether he should be interviewed, he said, is it about science? I really like science. And I said, oh, you're going to be all (laughs) over this. So, So he's very interested. But he was, you would kind of like to think that someone who is a student in school today would be more aware than someone who's 55 years old. Aren't they teaching overshoot in school? (laughs) Not really. (laughs) Not really. No, not yet anyway. But anyway, I thought it was refreshing that he was genuinely shocked. In fact, let's share a little bit of that with our listeners. Wait, 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 wait. So it it has something to do with natural resources. And that's crazy. Yeah, you can just tell that, number one, he's really shocked, and number two, he really cares, and he really wants to do something about it. Yeah, that's what I loved about his interview. He just was, he seemed so excited, I guess not excited about the topics, that like, this is bad, this happening, but he was generally interested in learning about it, and he seemed to, like, want to know more, and maybe even, like, help later, and so that was really cool to hear him generally interested in it. Yeah. So what made it so that the only way he found out about this was from some kook with a video camera in the park (laughs) doing interviews? Why isn't that being taught in school? And why isn't Earth Overshoot Day, August 1st, going to be the top newspaper headline around the world or the number one headline on Yahoo or wherever you get your news? I don't know. I guess people just are unaware, and hopefully we can teach them more. (laughs) But we've got our work cut out for us, don't we? Mm -hmm. It should be big news. I think part of it, of course, is the whole psychology of denial, which I don't think is an exact science. And we want to believe that we're invincible. Yeah. The fact that we are in overshoot and that that is bad news doesn't really line up with our worldview that we are made to have dominion over the earth and that progress is everybody lives better this year than they did last year. Yeah, at some point, it's like our Earth isn't going to be able to support it, but people think, oh, it's in the future. It's not my problem. Yeah. So, 
Well, climate change is one of the biggest pieces of evidence out there that it's happening now. And it's in slow motion, but we're destabilizing the climate because we are in overshoot. And this was a really pretty fun part of the conversation with Juju. In fact, let's play a little bit of our conversation about the planet being able to clean itself. If we didn't burn so much coal and so much gasoline, uh, then the Earth's atmosphere could actually clean itself like it used to do 100 years ago, right? Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait, wait. you telling me the Earth used to be able to clean itself. I ain't never know that. Yeah. You know, that's what living sustainably is really about, is that we're not putting so, so now much... the Earth doesn't clean itself anymore, basically. And we're basically... It does. It's trying to keep up, but it cannot keep up with the size of our population and the size of our economy anymore. It used to be able to do that 200 years ago when there were... The a bill, Earth, only a billion people, and we and we weren't all flying around yeah. on private jets. Earth wasn't designed for all this. You know, the whole concept that if we don't put too much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, then the atmosphere, just natural processes, kind of take care of it. We aren't destabilizing the climate. The climate had been pretty steady and pretty accommodating to humankind for quite a while because there weren't so many of us and we weren't burning so many fossil fuels. Well, that's like... The most amazing thing about nature is like if you look back through history, it's like if there's some natural disaster or something big, even the earth will balance itself out and go back into equilibrium. Like that's just how it works. But the anthropogenic part of it is like we're unbalancing that to so much of an extent that we're kind of tipping the scale. And it's just sad that it's like Mother Nature can't (laughs) clean up after us forever. Yep. We got way too big. So now it's challenging. The show notes are going to be a goldmine this time because we're going to have a lot of links. And one of the links will be to Earth Overshoot Day, the the special website for the Global Footprint Network. And we'll include a link to a page they've put together with some ideas about how you can help to move the date later. And one of the great links is going to be to the footprint calculator. Say you want to do a baseline. You want to see, well, I wonder where I am in this. Do I have a really big footprint and do I have some work to do or am I already living pretty sustainably? There are a number of footprint calculators out there, but we'll include a link to the Global Footprint Network's calculator so you can kind of take a little self-test. And Yeah, and those are really fun. In high school, my friends and I did those in my environmental class and it was interesting because we all were competing. We're like, who's more sustainable? So share with your friends who's more sustainable. Yeah, you're going to be surprised. If you hop on planes more than once a year, that's going to have a huge impact on your footprint, unfortunately. And that's something that... Really, only Juju really came up with the idea of flying less. Yeah. Yeah, we all need to do that. I know I should cut down a lot more on flying. That is one thing that I know I'm bad at. (laughs) But uh, it's hard. (laughs) Normally, at this time of the podcast, we would do our lightening the load segment. And we keep on skipping that because we run long. And, of course, this episode... That's all we've been talking about is lightening the load. Do you want to do a lightening the load? Do you have something interesting to talk about? Well, I know you had an interesting thing to talk about, you said, so you should at least should we do just yours. Do it? Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Okay. Mine, you'll be shocked. You'll. I, I bet you might have never even thought of this. I'll be really impressed if you have. <laughs> and I thought of this because I went to a, a memorial service in another state. So I got on an airplane and I flew and I stayed in a hotel and I'm in this hotel room that has a waste basket by the bed it has a waste basket by the desk it has a waste basket in the bathroom three waste baskets and it's just me dave and i'm in that room a couple of hours each night and each waste basket is lined with a plastic bag you see that <laughs> everywhere you go they line their waste baskets with plastic bags and every time somebody empties the trash do they just dump the trash out of the bag no they take the bag and tie it up and then put that in their cart and wheel off and so we've got all these little plastic bags full of trash so it takes god knows how long before bio Degradation can even begin to take place with that trash because the plastic has to biodegrade. Yeah. And so it may never happen, right? <laughs> and we're using fossil fuels to manufacture those bags. And I think for the most part, they're pretty unnecessary. So I just use one trash can so that when the maid comes in behind me, they're just going to leave the other two alone. I've saved a couple of plastic bags. <laughs> I've saved their lives. Yeah, <laughs> I've never thought about that. I don't think I stay in hotels that often. So like... Okay. 
I, that's a good point, though. But if you're anywhere, if you're in an office or anywhere you are and you find, well, there's multiple choices for a trash can, it would be really convenient to just drop my trash here. And you look in there and you s- notice there's nothing in that trash can. You might say, oh, that plastic bag might be able to survive to see another day. I think I'll put my trash in that trash can over there that already has trash in it. It's a small thing. Yeah. But for me, I go out of my way to not have to tie up my trash in a plastic bag. I go out of my way to not line every trash can with a plastic bag and just dump a basic raw trash can into the trash. Try to have as little trash as possible. But why add a plastic bag to every load of trash? Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. And you hadn't thought of that before, Yeah, right? no, that was, yeah, great lighting load. I'd never thought about that. All right, I'm pretty but, proud of myself. Yeah. So my lightning load for this week is actually, I guess, last week or maybe two weekends ago. Unfortunately, I did get on a plane. So when I went to see some friends in Chicago, I was sad that I was admitting CO2 when flying. But knowing that, I was like, I'm going to be trying to be as sustainable as possible in every other aspect. So I brought with me a reusable fork and a reusable napkin. And even when I was in the airport, I there's only a few restaurants that I could eat at. But I looked for ones that had to-go containers that were more sustainable or could be recycled and I found this one place that had um, a cardboard like container thing so it was compostable and then I used my usual napkin and fork so when I was done I didn't have like, any really trash it was just all compost and fortunately the airport had that so I was really excited I was like okay at least I'm helping a little so that was kind of cool very impressive yeah very so. impressive and you reminded me of something that I hadn't had a chance to tell this story since it happened since we did the plastic straw things but I've had reusable straws in a drawer in the kitchen for several years. Somebody gave those to me as a gift because they knew I was obsessive compulsive about this kind of thing. But I never thought until we started talking about the campaign in Portland to ditch the straw and looked at that video with that sea turtle that had that straw up its nose, horrible video. I hadn't ever thought that I should be taking these straws with me when I go to restaurants, uh, that I really needed to refuse straws when waiters and waitresses brought me a drink with a straw. But we were going to a rock concert, and I thought, you know what? I figured I might actually buy a Coke at the concert because I needed to be alert and awake for the drive home. (laughs) And so I had my own straw to put in that beverage so that I didn't use a disposable plastic straw. But I could have taken a reusable cup and gone to the snack bar and said, will you please put my Coke in this cup? And I'm pretty sure they would not have. Yeah, there's. it's interesting when you try to ask people to fill up your reusable containers like I've tried to ask for coffee in them before and certain places won't let me do that they're like it's not clean and like you're not touching it to the container like the nozzle or anything you're just putting it underneath it but I guess there's very strict regulations on that so unless it's like a small or like family-owned sort of vibe a lot of times they won't let you which is really sad yeah and I'm hoping we can move away from that in fact here's another story I for (laughs) kidney beans We have a salad for dinner frequently at our house and no meat, just a salad. And so in order to have some protein, I like to put kidney beans in the salad. And so I don't buy canned kidney beans because that's kind of a waste of a container. I buy kidney beans in bulk and I put them in my own reusable container. I don't put them in a disposable plastic bag. Yeah. Unfortunately, there aren't that many places where I can get them in bulk. So here in town, the place I go is Whole Foods. And I've been taking this big plastic container that's reusable. I take that in there and I fill it from their bulk kidney beans bin. And they have already pre-weighed that container so they know what to subtract for the weight of the container. And I pay for it at the check stand and I go. Last week when I was up there doing that, the manager informed me that the health department has told them that they cannot let people take their own containers in to refill. That's so crazy because a lot of like zero waste people will go to like bulk places and do that because then you don't have any extra waste that's is it all whole foods or just that one well i think that's the health department in colorado springs but that's exactly the same reaction i had i said what (laughs) i don't know how many health departments are going to stand in the way of that it's just weird because like there are certain like specifically bulk food stores that are made like with the dispensers so you can bring your own container like there's a lot of them that are it's like a new not trend but like a new thing that's popping up which is really exciting 
everywhere so it's like how can a whole store be like centered around that and then like whole foods can't do it for a small portion so i haven't had a chance to research that but i intend to call our local health department and get to the bottom of this and maybe (laughs) we need to change a city code or a, a rule or something like that to get with the 21st century here yeah that's crazy yeah all right well that brings us to the conclusion of another beautiful episode of the growth busters podcast yep this is a fun one i want to thank you dana for joining me for this dana has been visiting in colorado springs and interning for the last several weeks so she's been actually right here at the table across from me from these podcasts and dana you're getting ready to head back home and then head back to school and so we will not have the benefit of your close physical proximity (laughs) With a little luck, we might be able to get you to phone it in every once in a while. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, hopefully. (laughs) But if you don't, if for some reason your schedule gets too crazy and we don't get a chance to get you back on a podcast right away, I just want to thank you for the co-hosting that you've done this summer. It's been a lot of fun having you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. All right. Well, be sure to visit growthbusters.org to explore these issues in more detail. It is so much deeper than just giving up plastic straws and even changing your thermostat. And don't forget to check out the Earth Overshoot Day video. It's going to be at the Growth Busters YouTube channel uh, and everywhere else, our Facebook page. So please share that around and see what you can do to move the date. We love to share listener feedback. So send us an email or provide a comment on the podcast page or tweet or something and let us know what you're doing to move the date. Some may dream to paint mountains and streams. But not me, I'm a growth buster. Some they just want more, but don't know what it's for. But not me, I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather. But no, not us, we are the growth buster. Calling, 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 calling.